23. Dusander's sleep was uneasy. He lay in a trench of bad dreams. They were breaking down the fence, thousands, perhaps millions of them. They ran out of the jungle and threw themselves against the electrified barbed wire, and now it was beginning to lean ominously inward. Some of the strands had given way, and now coiled uneasily on the packed earth of the parade ground, squirting blue sparks. And still there was no end to them, no end. The Fuhrer was as mad as Rommel had claimed if he thought now, if he had ever thought there could be a final solution to this problem. There were billions of them. They filled the universe, and they were all after him. Old man. Wake up, old man. Dusander. Wake up, old man, wake up. At first he thought this was the voice of the dream. Spoken in German, it had to be part of the dream. That was why the voice was so terrifying, of course. If he awoke, he would escape it, so he swam upward. The man was sitting by his bed, on a chair that had been turned around backwards. A real man. Wake up, old man, this visitor was saying. He was young, no more than thirty. His eyes were dark and studious behind plain steel-framed glasses. His brown hair was longish, collar-length, and for a confused moment Dusander thought it was the boy in a disguise. But this was not the boy, wearing a rather old-fashioned blue suit much too hot for the California climate. There was a small silver pin on the lapel of the suit, silver the metal you use to kill vampires and werewolves. It was a Jewish star. Are you speaking to me? Dusanda asked in German. Who else? Your roommate is gone. Heisel? Yes, he went home yesterday. Are you awake now? Of course. But you've apparently mistaken me for someone else. My name is Arthur Denker. Perhaps you have the wrong room. My name is Weisskopf, and yours is Kurt Dusander. Dusander wanted to lick his lips, but didn't. Just possibly this was still all part of the dream. A new phase, no more. Bring me a wino and a steak knife, Mr. Jewish Star, in the lapel, and I'll blow you away like smoke. I know no Dusander, he told the young man. I don't understand you. Shall I ring for the nurse? You understand, Weisskopf said. He shifted position slightly and brushed a lock of hair from his forehead. The prosiness of this gesture dispelled Dusander's last hope. Heisel, Weisskopf said, and pointed at the empty bed. Heisel, Dusander, Weisskopf, none of these names mean anything to me. Heisel fell off a ladder while he was nailing a new gutter onto the side of his house, Weisskopf said. He broke his back. He may never walk again. Unfortunate. But that was not the only tragedy of his life. He was an inmate of Patin where he lost his wife and daughters. Patin, which you commanded. I think you are insane, Dusander said. My name is Arthur Denker. I came to this country when my wife died. Before that, I was... Spare me your tale, Weisskopf said, raising a hand. He had not forgotten your face. This face. Weisskopf flicked a photograph into Dusander's face like a magician doing a trick. It was one of those the boy had shown him years ago. A young Dusander in a jauntily cocked SS cap, seated behind his desk. Dusander spoke slowly, in English now, enunciating carefully. During the war, I was a factory machinist. My job was to oversee the manufacture of drive columns and power trains for armored cars and trucks. Later, I helped to build Tiger tanks. My reserve unit was called up during the Battle of Berlin, and I fought honorably, if briefly. After the war, I worked in Essen, at the Menschler Motorworks, until, until it became necessary for you to run away to South America, with your gold that had been melted down from Jewish teeth, and your silver melted down from Jewish jewelry at your numbered Swiss bank account. Mr. Heisel went home a happy man, you know. Oh, he had a bad moment when he woke up in the dark and realized with whom he was sharing a room. But he feels better now. He feels that God allowed him the sublime privilege of breaking his back so that he could be instrumental in the capture of one of the greatest butchers of human beings ever to live. Dusander spoke slowly, enunciating carefully. During the war, I was a factory machinist. Oh, why not drop it? 
Your papers will not stand up to a serious examination. I know it, and you know it. You are found out. My job was to oversee the manufacture of, of corpses. One way or another, you will be in Tel Aviv before the new year. The authorities are cooperating with us this time, Dusander. The Americans want to make us happy, and you are one of the things that will make us happy. The manufacture of drive columns and power trains for armored cars and trucks. Later, I hope to build tiger tanks. Why be tiresome? Why drag it out? My reserve unit was called up very well, then. You'll see me again, soon. Wise Cup rose, he left the room. For a moment, his shadow bobbed on the wall, and then that was gone, too. Dusander closed his eyes. He wondered if Wise Cup could be telling the truth about American cooperation. Three years ago, when oil was tight in America, he wouldn't have believed it. But the current upheaval in Iran might well harden American support for Israel. It was possible. And what did it matter? One way or the other, legal or illegal, Weisskopf and his colleagues would have him. On the subject of Nazis, they were intransigent. And on the subject of the camps, they were lunatics. He was trembling all over. But he knew what he must do now. 24. The school records for the pupils who had passed through Santo Donato Junior High were kept in an old rambling warehouse on the north side. It was not far from the abandoned train yard. It was dark and echoing, and it smelled of wax and polish and 999 industrial cleaner. It was also the school department's custodial warehouse. Ed French got there around four in the afternoon, with Norma in tow. A janitor let them in, told Ed what he wanted was on the fourth floor, and showed them to a creeping, clanking elevator that frightened Norma into an uncharacteristic silence. She regained herself on the fourth floor, prancing and capering up and down the dim aisles of stacked boxes and files, while Ed searched for and eventually found the files containing report cards from 1975. He pulled the second box and began to leaf through the bees. Bork, Bostwick, Boswell, Bowden, Todd. He pulled the card, shook his head impatiently over it in the dim light, and took it across to one of the high, dusty windows. "'Don't run around in here, honey,' he called over his shoulder. Why, Daddy? Because the trolls will get you, he said, and held Todd's card up to the light. He saw it at once. This report card in those files for three years now had been carefully, almost professionally doctored. Jesus Christ, Ed French muttered. Trolls, 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 Norma sang gleefully as she continued to dance up and down the aisles. 25. Dusander walked carefully down the hospital corridor. He was still a bit unsteady on his legs. He was wearing his blue bathrobe over his white hospital johnny. It was night now, just after eight o'clock, and the nurses were changing shifts. The next half hour would be confused. He had observed that all the shift changes were confused. It was a time for exchanging notes, gossip, and drinking coffee at the nurses' station, which was just around the corner from the drinking fountain. What he wanted was just a cross from the drinking fountain. He was not noticed in the wide hallway, which at this hour reminded him of a long and echoing train station minutes before a passenger train departs. The walking wounded paraded slowly up and down, some dressed in robes as he was, others holding the backs of their johnnies together. Disconnected music came from half a dozen transistor radios in half a dozen different rooms. Visitors came and went. A man laughed in one room, and another man seemed to be weeping across the hall. A doctor walked by with his nose in a paperback novel. Dusander went to the fountain, got a drink, wiped his mouth with his cupped hand, and looked at the closed door across the hall. This door was always locked. At least that was the theory. In practice, he had observed that it was sometimes both unlocked and unattended. Most often during the chaotic half-hour when the shifts were changing and the nurses were gathered around the corner. Dusander had observed all of this with the trained and wary eye of a man who has been on the jump for a long, long time. He only wished he could observe the unmarked door for another week or so, looking for dangerous breaks in the pattern. He would only have the one chance. But he didn't have another week. His status as werewolf in residence might not become known for another two or three days, but it might happen tomorrow. He did not dare wait. When it came out, he would be watched constantly. He took another small drink, wiped his mouth again, and looked both ways. 
Then, casually, with no effort at concealment, he stepped across the hall, turned the knob, and walked into the drug closet. If the woman in charge had happened to already be behind her desk, he was only near-sighted Mr. Denker. So sorry, dear lady, I thought it was the W.C. Stupid of me. But the drug closet was empty. He ran his eye over the top shelf at his left. Nothing but eye drops and ear drops. Second shelf laxatives, suppositories. On the third shelf he saw both Secanol and Veronol. He slipped a bottle of Secanols into the pocket of his robe. Then he went back to the door and stepped out without looking around, a puzzled smile on his face. That certainly wasn't the W.C., was it? There it was, right next to the drinking fountain. Stupid me. He crossed to the door labeled men, went inside and washed his hands. Then he went back down the hall to the semi-private room that was now completely private since the departure of the illustrious Mr. Heisel. On the table between the beds was a glass and a plastic pitcher filled with water. Pity there was no bourbon, really, it was a shame. But the pills would float him off just as nicely, no matter how they were washed down. Morris Heisel, salute, he said with a faint smile, and poured himself a glass of water. After all those years of jumping at shadows, of seeing faces that looked familiar on park benches or in restaurants or bus terminals, he had finally been recognized and turned in by a man he wouldn't have known from Adam. It was almost funny. He had barely spared Heisel two glances. Heisel and his broken back from God. On second thought, it wasn't almost funny, it was very funny. He put three pills in his mouth, swallowed them with water, took three more, and then three more. In the room across the hall, he could see two old men hunched over a night table, playing a grumpy game of cribbage. One of them had a hernia, Dusanda knew. What was the other? Gallstones? Kidney stones? Tumor? Prostate? Or horrors of old age? They were legion. He refilled his water glass, but didn't take any more pills right away. Too many could defeat his purpose. He might throw them up and they would pump the residue out of his stomach, saving him for whatever indignities the Americans and the Israelis could devise. He had no intention of trying to take his life stupidly, like a housefrau on a crying jag. When he began to get drowsy, he would take a few more. That would be fine. The quavering voice of one of the cribbage players came to him, thin and triumphant. A double run of three for eight, fifteens for twelve, and the right jack for thirteen. How do you like those apples? Don't worry, the old man with the hernia said confidently. I got first count. I'll peg out. Peg out, Dusanda thought. Sleepy now. An apt enough phrase, but the Americans had a turn for idiom. I don't give a tin shit. Get hip or get out. Stick it where the sun don't shine. Money talks. Nobody walks. Wonderful idiom. They thought they had him, but he was going to peg out before their very eyes. He found himself wishing, of all absurd things, that he could leave a note for the boy, wishing he could tell him to be very careful, to listen to an old man who had finally overstepped himself. He wished he could tell the boy that in the end he, Dusander, had come to respect him even if he could never like him, and that talking to him had been better than listening to the run of his own thoughts. But any note, no matter how innocent, might cast suspicion on the boy, and Dusander did not want that. Oh, he would have a bad month or two waiting for some government agent to show up and question him about a certain document that had been found in a safety deposit box rented to Kurt Dusander, a.k.a. Arthur Denker. But after a time, the boy would come to believe he had been telling the truth. There was no need for the boy to be touched by any of this as long as he kept his head. Dusander reached out with a hand that seemed to stretch for miles, got the glass of water and took another three pills. He put the glass back, closed his eyes, and settled deeper into his soft, soft pillow. He had never felt so much like sleeping, and his sleep would be long. It would be restful, unless there were dreams. The thought shocked him. Dreams? Please, God... No, not those dreams, not for eternity, not with all possibility of awakening gone, not in sudden terror he tried to struggle awake. It seemed that hands were reaching eagerly up out of the bed to grab him, hands with hungry fingers. No! His thoughts broke up 
in a steepening spiral of darkness, and he rode down that spiral as if down a greased slide, down and down to whatever dreams there are. His overdose was discovered at 1.35 a.m., and he was pronounced dead 15 minutes later. The nurse on duty was young and had been susceptible to elderly Mr. Denker's slightly ironic courtliness. She burst into tears. She was a Catholic, and she could not understand why such a sweet old man, who had been getting better, would want to do such a thing and damn his immortal soul to hell. 26. On Saturday morning in the Bowden household, nobody got up until at least nine. This morning at 9.30, Todd and his father were reading at the table, and Monica, who was a slow waker, served them scrambled eggs, juice, and coffee without speaking, still half in her dreams. Todd was reading a paperback science fiction novel, and Dick was absorbed in architectural digest when the paper slapped against the door. Want me to get it, Dad? I will. Dick brought it in, started to sip his coffee, and then choked on it as he got a look at the front page. Dick, what's wrong? Monica asked, hurrying toward him. Dick coughed out coffee that had gone down the wrong pipe, and while Todd looked at him over the top of the paperback in mild wonder, Monica started to pound him on the back. On the third stroke, her eyes fell to the paper's headline, and she stopped in mid-stroke as if playing statues. Her eyes widened until it seemed they might actually fall out onto the table. Holy God, up in heaven, Dick Bowden managed in a choked voice. Isn't that... I can't believe... Monica began, and then stopped. She looked at Todd. Oh, honey. His father was looking at him, too. Alarmed now, Todd came around the table. What's the matter? Mr. Denker, Dick said. It was all he could manage. Todd read the headline and understood everything. In dark letters, it read, Fugitive Nazi commits suicide in Santo Donato Hospital. Below were two photos, side by side. Todd had seen both of them before. One showed Arthur Denker, six years younger and spryer. Todd knew it had been taken by a hippie street photographer and that the old man had bought it only to make sure it didn't fall into the wrong hands by chance. The other photo showed an SS officer named Kurt Dusander behind his desk at Patton, his cap cocked to one side. If they had the photograph the hippie had taken, they had been in his house. Todd skimmed the article, his mind whizzing frantically. No mention of the winos, but the bodies would be found and when they were, it would be a worldwide story. Patton Commandant never lost his touch. Horror in Nazis' basement. He never stopped killing. Todd Bowden swayed on his feet. Far away, echoing, he heard his mother cry sharply, Catch him, Dick, he's fainting! The word fainting, fainting, fainting repeated itself over and over. He dimly felt his father's arms grab him. And then, for a little while, Todd felt nothing. Heard nothing at all. 27. Ed French was eating a Danish when he unfolded the paper. He coughed, made a strange gagging sound, and spat dismembered pastry all over the table. Eddie, Sandra French said with some alarm. Are you okay? Daddy's choking, daddy's choking, little Norma proclaimed with nervous good humor, and then happily joined her mother in slamming Ed on the back. Ed barely felt the blows. He was still goggling down at the newspaper. What's wrong, Eddie? Sandra asked again. Him! Him! Ed shouted, stabbing his finger down at the paper so hard that his fingernail tore all the way through the A section. That man! Lord Peter! What in God's name are you... T That's Todd Bowden's grandfather! What? That war criminal? Eddie, that's crazy. But it's him, Ed almost moaned. Jesus Christ Almighty, that's him. Sandra French looked at the picture long and fixedly. He doesn't look like Peter Whimsey at all, she said finally. 